uh, origins, lesson 10, stewardship in the environment. What we're studying today is a Sabbath school lesson for the first quarter of 2013. What I will do is go through it with a few comments and then uh, some end comments of my own. Also go over the book that was written as a companion to it by uh, James Gibson. And uh, then we will have hopefully plenty of time to throw the uh, floor open for questions and comments that you may have. The principal contributor for our Sabbath School lesson this quarter is uh, James Gibson, who is the uh, director of the Geoscience Research Institute here in Loma Linda. The editor is Clifford Goldstein, who is no uh, stranger to controversy over creation. Um, there are a number of other people that uh, helped out in producing the lesson. Um, we've already gone through uh, several lessons. Most people would be ta going through Jesus Provider and Sustainer. That was two weeks ago for us. We're now on stewardship in the environment. And uh, uh, we have three more to go, Sabbath, a gift from Eden, and then a break now because Andy McIntosh will be in town. And then finally, creation in the gospel and creation again. Uh, the memory text for today is uh, Genesis 128. Um, and I, I suppose I should ask how many of you people know that by heart. Not too many. Um, then God blessed them and said, God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And we're going to discuss that dominion today. The world in which we live is a gift of love from the Creator God, from Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Within this creation, He placed humans set intentionally in relationship with Himself, other persons, and the surrounding world. Therefore, as Seventh-day Adventists, we hold its preservation and nurture to be intimately related to our service to him. That's a quote. Since human poverty and environmental degradation are interrelated, we pledge ourselves to improve the quality of life for all people. Our goal is the sustainable development of resources while meeting human needs. When people are poor, they tend not to care about the environment because they don't have enough extra resources to do so. In this commitment, we confirm our stewardship of God's creation and believe that total restoration will be complete only when God makes all things new. And those are excerpts from Caring for Creation, a Statement of the Environment by the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. And if you want to know, that can be found on the web, um, and the address will come up a little bit later. Dominion was given at creation. According to Genesis 1.26, Adam's dominion extended to all of the created entities. 126, of course, is our memory verse. In the sea, on land, and in the air. Dominion includes the idea of ruling or having power over these creatures. Nothing is said about dominion over the forces of nature themselves, only over the creatures. And according to the text, this rule is universal. Adam was to be essentially the ruler of the earth. Then it says, read again Psalm 8. What is David's response to the honor that God gave him as humans? What does it mean that we have been given glory and honor, honor and glory, especially in the context of humans having been give, given dominion over the earth? And for those of you who don't instantly recognize it, that's uh, Psalm 8, which starts out, O Lord, O Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens, out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, and then when I consider thy heavens, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And uh, then verse 5 is that dominion that you heard for thou <coughs> hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou hast made him have dominion over the works of thy hands. And then it lists them. And then verse 9 forms an envelope with verse 1. According to Genesis 2.19, one of Adam's earliest tasks was to name the animals. Names had great meaning in biblical times. One's name represented one's person and often one's status. The authority to give names to the birds and beasts was confirmation of Adam's status as a ruler over the animals. 
Then it says, read Genesis 2.15. In what ways do you see the principle of stewardship revealed here? And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And we're going to come back to, to dress it later on when we talk about um, uh, uh, Jim Gibson's book. But uh, to keep it, Adam was assigned the task of caring for the garden to manage it and to tend its needs. The Hebrew root shamar, translated here as keep it, often means to watch over or protect, to guard if you, if you wish. It's interesting that Adam didn't quite guard the garden well enough. Um, the garden was a gift to Adam, as an expression of God's love, and Adam was now given responsibility over it. Another example of the dominion that Adam received at the time of creation. And as we've mentioned before, that's a special gift because if, in contrast to uh, the American promise of a chicken in every pot, if you're an Old Testament person, the promise was every man under his own vine and under his own fig tree. That's your garden. Not the garden with the vegetables that you have to cultivate. It's the garden with the trees that you just prune a little bit here and there and pick the fruit. It was easy life. That was the original garden as well. How should our, the quarterly asks, how should our understanding of God as the creator, or even more specifically, our understanding of the creation story itself, impact the ways in which we treat the environment? Why should our understanding of these things protect us from either gross indifference toward the environment, or in contrast, a fanatical devotion to it? And um, we'll go into that in a little more detail later on. Caring for other creatures. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. Psalm 50, verse 10. What in this text touches on the topic of our stewardship of the earth? Well, of course, it's not ours. In, um, I think that was a slide that escaped. Read Revelation 4.11. How does this text contrast radically with the common atheistic notions of a creation without a creator, a creation that comes into being purely by chance alone. And, uh, of course, this is the song of the uh, four elders and uh, the four creatures, among other things. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And the point of it is that they're not ours, they're God's. Creation of the animals was not an accident or an afterthought. In fact, he created them before he created people. God intentionally created them. It was his will that they should exist, and it is this principle that should guide our treatment of them. And then it lists some texts and uh, uh, having to do with treatment of animals. Your ox and your ass rest. If you see the ass of him that hateth thee lying under its burden and wouldst forbear to help him, thou shalt surely help with him. And the interesting thing is compare that with, with the next text, which is Proverbs 10, 12, 10. The righteous man regardeth the life of his beast, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. And in fact, if you want to, be, if you want to put that with the text uh, Exodus 23, 5, it implies that a righteous man not only regards the life of his own beast, but he regards the life of the beasts of the wicked. And uh, then Jesus asked, which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a pit and will not straightly pull him out on the Sabbath day? And the quarterly goes on to say, indeed, cruelty towards animals and indifference toward their suffering are widely recognized as being symptomatic of personality disorders. Many organizations have been established to promote good treatment of animals, and rightly so. However, at the same time, some people have gone so far as to claim that humans are not intrinsically more important than animals, and so humans should not be given preferential treatment. In many ways, this is a train of thought that flows logically from an evolutionary model of human origins. After all, we were just animals with bigger brains. 
If we are only separated by time and chance, why should we be more special than they? One philosopher has even argued that a chicken or a fish has more personhood than does a fetus in the womb or even a newborn infant. However ridiculous these ideas may, might sound, they can be derived with a fair amount of logic from an atheistic evolutionary model of human origins. Of course, such ideas are not supported in scripture. Humans have special status in God's plan in contrast to the animals. And um, God made Adam coats of skin. He uh, inst instituted the sacrificial system. Animals die in the place of humans. And he allowed us to eat animals. Although, of course, that wasn't the first diet. And then the quarter said, put yourself in the mind of an atheist evolutionist and work through the reasons for why you think that animals should be treated no differently from humans. What should this tell you about how important our presuppositions are in determining the outcome of our thought? Then uh, the next uh, day it talks about the Sabbath and the environment and As we've seen, the, st uh, the concept of stewardship in the context of the way in which we take care of the planet is tied directly to the creation. Our views of creation will influence our view on the way on which we should relate to the creation. For some, the creation is to be exploited, used, even pillaged to whatever degree necessary in order to fill our own desires and wants. Others, in contrast, all but worship the creation itself. And it says, see Romans 1.25, which, who change the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. And there is the biblical view which should give us a balanced perspective on the way in which we re relate to the world that God, that the Lord created for us. And then I'm not going to read Exodus 28 through 11. I'm sure most of you have that memorized. Um, it asks what do we find in this commandment that relates to stewardship. And basically it is that uh, the, the Lord made heaven and earth and therefore commands us to give rest not only to ourselves and the slaves that were, that were held at that time and the servants that we have now, but also the cattle, the stranger that is within our gates. God set aside the Seventh-day Sabbath as a memorial and perpetual reminder of his creative act and the establishment of the world. And stewardship flows from that. That's another excerpt from Caring for Creation. It's a fairly short, probably has about six paragraphs in it. I didn't actually count them, but I read it. Uh, by pointing us to the fact that God created us in the world that we inhabit, the Sabbath is, in, is a constant reminder that we are not wholly autonomous creatures, able to do whatever we wish to others and to the world itself. Sabbath should teach us that we are indeed stewards and that stewardship entails responsibilities. And as we can see in the commandment itself, responsibility extends to how we treat those who are under us. Think about how you treat other people, particularly those who are under your dominion, if you're an employer, for example. Are you treating them with respect, fairness, and grace? Or are you taking advantage? If the latter remember one day, you will have to answer for your actions. Stewards of our health, we're stewards of a lot of things, and uh, the environment is not the only thing. Um, as we have seen throughout the quarter, God's original creator, uh, creation was good, even very good. Everything and everyone came forth from the hand of the Creator in a state of perfection. There was no sickness, no disease, no death. Contrary to the evolutionary model in which disease, sickness, and death are part of the very means of creation, these things came only after the fall, after the entrance of sin. Thus it is only against the background of the creation story that we can understand better the biblical teaching about health and healing. Then the uh, quarterly says, read. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, another familiar passage to most Adventists. What is our responsibility to God regarding the care of our bodies? This is the one that says, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, 
which is in you. For you're bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Our bodies are the vehicles for our brains, and it is through our brain that the Spirit, Holy Spirit communicates with us. If we wish to have communion with God, we must take care of our bodies and our brains. If we abuse our bodies, we destroy ourselves both physically and spiritually. According to this text, the whole question of health itself and how we take care of our bodies, the temple of God, is a moral issue. If you like, that's our personal environment. Care of our health is a vital part of our relationship to God. Obviously, some pa aspects of our health are beyond our power. We all have defective genes, and we are all exposed to unknown chemicals or other damaging agents. And we are all at risk of physical injury that may damage our health. God knows all this, but to the extent that lies within our power, we are to do our best to maintain our bodies made in the image of God. And uh, Ellen White comments in the Review and Herald, uh, let none who profess godliness and regard with indifference the health of the body and flatter themselves that intemperance is no sin and will not affect their spirituality. A close sympathy exists between the physical and the moral nature. The standard of virtue is elevated or degraded by the physical habits. Any habit which does not promote healthful action in the human system degrades the higher and nobler, nobler faculties. Stewardship principles. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. And the quarterly asks, how does this text help to set the foundation for a biblically-based concept of stewardship. We often tend to think of stewardship in terms of money, as we've seen this week. However, stewardship involves much more than just that. Yet, whether dealing with money or with the environmental concerns or our own health, there are certain principles involved in good stewardship, principles that have their ultimate foundation in the creation, as depicted in Genesis. In the end, because God is our creator and because everything we have is a gift from him, we are obligated before him to be good stewards of whatever has been entrusted to us. And then it says, read Matthew 25, 14 to 30 to see that how this parable illustrates the rewards of good stewardship. And it asks, what is the message of this parable regarding the principles of stewardship in general? And I won't re reproduce the entire passage, but it's the one that talks about the ten, uh, or the uh, the servants, the one who got five talents and made another five, and one who got two and made another two, and one who buried his single talent. To his servants, Christ commits his goods, something to, put, to be put to use for him. He gives every man his work. Each has his place in the eternal plan of heaven. Each is to work in cooperation with Christ for the salvation of souls. No more surely is the place prepared for us in the heavenly mansions than is this special place designated on earth where we are to work for God. And of course, is Ellen White, Christ Object Lessons. And then the quarterly ask, what are you doing with the talents in which you've been entrusted? Remember, everything good comes from the Father of the heavenly lights. What choices can you make that will enable you to use these gifts in better service for the Lord's work? And... Now we're into Friday's uh, section. Uh, Christ followers have been redeemed for ser service. The Lord teaches us that the true object of life is ministry. Christ himself was a worker, and to all his followers he gives the law of service, service to God and their fellow men. Here Christ has presented to the world a higher conception of life than they had ever known. By living to minister for others, man is brought into connection with Christ. The law of service becomes a connecting link which binds us to God and to our fellow men. And uh, now we're going to switch to comments from uh, Jim Gibson's book Origins that uh, were not directly found in the quarterly. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to read the whole chapter. It's, that's too long. But... Uh, give you some of the highlights of things that were there that I found interesting. Good rulers keep the best interests of those they govern in mind, while bad rulers govern for, govern for their own benefit. And I think that's an important distinction that uh, is sometimes lost. Adam was to tend literally to serve Abad, the garden. Uh, 
the word, the word Evid is actually the Hebrew for servant or slave, and the distinction between those two is kind of lost. Um, um, so Adam is not just to keep the garden, he's actually to serve it. Interesting that he's given dominion, and his dominion is to serve. This is Old Testament support for Jesus saying, he who is the greatest of you must be your servant. And when the flood was over, God remembered not only Noah, but every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And there are a number of other passages that, that show God's care for animals that are mentioned as well. Uh, but this is one that uh, we sometimes gloss over. We think, oh, God was interested in Noah, but he's actually interested in all those animals too. Uh, in the notes, and I'm not sure quite why this uh, got in, but it's got in twice now in the book, and that is Jim Gibson is saying that there's no basis for supporting that the behemoth of Job was some kind of dinosaur. Um, and that, of course, will uh, raise some interesting uh, questions in, in some people. Uh, and then another p p part of a passage that he talks about something that I, I found interesting was uh, whether to develop an area for human use or to preserve it for the benefit of wild animals. This is a dilemma that, uh, that uh, sometimes comes up. And he says, too often such decisions are made solely on financial grounds rather than on the basis of the actual needs of both humans and wildlife. Apparently, the need of some people to make a lot of money is not uh, well, strictly speaking, a need. And then he talks about uh, two areas where the environment needs to be paid special attention to. One of them is pollution and one of them is excessive consumption. And he goes on to say, among other things, that uh, we should live simply. Which uh, is probably, well, it, in certain circles that's not popular. What's wrong with excess? Um, we are called to cooperate with God in providing the necessities of life to those in need. And then he says personal ministry is the most effective means for doing, of doing this. And then he suggests if you can't do personal ministries all the time, uh, that uh, supporting organizations that do the same thing would be appropriate. Uh, interestingly, in this particular passage, he doesn't talk about the government doing it, um, which again is... Uh, uh, inadvertently or perhaps not inadvertently taking sides in uh, certain kinds of political debates. Now, these are my thoughts and then we'll read the final questions that uh, are in the quarterly and then you can have at it. This lesson is one of the central reasons why the doctrine of creation is so important, at least in my opinion. Two weeks ago we talked about belief in miracles and how that's important. Uh, last week we noted that the nuclear family is hard to justify scientifically. Not impossible, uh, but just not easy. And uh, for those who don't wish to have it justified, uh, it becomes impossible. And this week we noted that a well-grounded concern, we note a well-grounded concern for the environment. Uh, and the question that I would ask is how do you justify a proper attitude toward the environment? And um, excuse me. Uh, where one starts, I think, determines where one ends. And uh, I'm going to give two secular ways of doing it. And then, uh, in my opinion, there are difficulties with the results. And then, uh, then my own uh, take on it. Uh, you can start with the freedom as the ultimate ethical principle. People should do, do what they want to. And you can elevate that into kind of a libertarian uh, principle. And if you're not careful, you're going to wind up with ignoring any ethical claims. After all, because you're totally free to do what you want. Um, and then you wind up having to justify the clubbing of baby seals. Because after all, that's what people want to do. What's wrong with it? Um, 
one can start with the idea that all life is sacred, including all animal life. Now notice that this is not strictly speaking derived from evolutionary theory, but it's where a lot of people go uh, when they have no other way of doing anything in principle. Uh, and it leads to, in my opinion, a truncated uh, system of ethics as well. One then ignores the fact that a lot of animals go extinct naturally, so you can't worship life, at least the way it is right now. And you have to justify releasing rabbits that you have just rec rescued from experimenters into the wild, where they're immediately eaten by foxes because they don't have any clue as to what they're supposed to be afraid of and what they're supposed to do. And this has actually happened. Um, and uh, somehow that's a better fate than, than somebody being careful uh, and perhaps learning something scientifically from those, uh, from those rabbits. Now, you can start with the Genesis story. And if you do that, then you have to work for a restoration of Eden while recognizing that it's not presently completely possible and therefore we have no right to demand that, but that we do the best that we can under the circumstances. I think you have to have then a hierarchy of values, holding human life above animal life, but noting that animal life does have some intrinsic value and is not to be taken uh, lightly. One then tempers freedom with responsibility, that we're not, we are maybe free to do whatever we want to, but have Hopefully, whatever we want to is going to be something that's, uh, that's actually worthwhile. Otherwise, the freedom without, uh, without any morality whatsoever is not really a good option. And one is allowed to do experiments on animals, but they are to be treated as if they are sacrificed. In fact, we use that term. The animals were sacrificed and uh, the teeth or the spleen or the livers or the heart were looked at. Um, and they are. And you have an obligation to be sure that you're not sacrificing to the wrong God. Uh, getting a paper out of it is not a good enough reason. And I think that one prefers a vegetarian diet and one other thing that's different from uh, some forms of radical environmentalism is that pets are actually allowed if they are taken seriously as valuable in their own right and not as something that we have the right to do whatever we want to. I mean, we can, but that's not ethical. And then we come to the discussion questions that are raised. And the first one is a pretty long one, so um, it'll cover, I think, actually three slides here. Some secularists have proposed that the value of life should not be measured by whether the life is human, but by its potential to live a pleasant life. They might value a young, healthy chimpanzee more than they do an old, diseased human. For instance, read the following quote from Australian Peter Singer, who argues that in certain cases humans shouldn't have any more rights than some animals do. And here's the quote. Far from having concern for all life, or a scale of concern, impartially based on the nature of the life in question, those who protest against abortion but dine regularly on the bodies of chicken, pigs, and calves show only a biased concern for the lives of members of our species. For on any fair comparison of morality, relevant characteristics like rationality, self-consciousness, awareness, autonomy, pleasure, pain, and so on, the calf, the pig, and the much derided <coughs> chicken come out well ahead of the fetus at any stage of pregnancy. While if we make the comparison with a fetus of less than three months old, a fish would show more signs of consciousness. And that's Peter Singer, who is currently at Harvard, if I understand correctly. He at least has been. Singer, of course, is an evolutionist, thus he believes there's really no overt quantitative, qualitative difference between us and the animals. We've just evolved into something different from what they did, that's all. And uh, the quarterly asks what's radically wrong with this picture. And of course, assuming that it's radically wrong, although I happen to agree with it on that, uh, how should we as Christians respond to this kind of thinking? And uh, that's one question that 
I kind of leave you with. And then the second question is, if you can find it, bring the class the entire text of Caring for the Environment, a, station, a statement on the environment, and there's the website. Otherwise, use the sections quoted in this week's Sabbath study, focus on how the statement ties in the generous creation to the environment, and dwell more on how a proper view of creation can protect us from taking an extreme position. And that concludes the questions that the quarterly left. And so now, you get to ask your own question and comment on them or whatever you think is uh, appropriate to comment on. And we're going to try, we're, we're recording this, so uh, for those of you who haven't been here before, um, if you get the microphone, you may find your voice on uh, the internet someday, so for what it's worth. Um, uh, you're welcome to uh, uh, make, make whatever comments you have. We, we'll, try to, we'll try to accommodate uh, those of you who can't. We have one back there. Pass that mic back. And, uh, and then uh, we'll get you third. Go ahead. Well, I was th thinking one day a while ago that um, you know, I, was, I was thinking about wars and, you know, the histories of wars and all that and how much people used to, or sides used to get God on their sides, you know, they get people to fight with them. Um, seems like it's a very important thing to do. Um, then, you know, I kind of thought about nowadays when you got so much atheism, what's really taken its place? So then I thought, you know, maybe it's the environment. Because um, people are almost becoming God, uh, earth worshipers. You know, that they, they actually um, are very careful with the earth, that they treat it with respect and dignity and all that, and so um, so if we, we treat it with more dignity, we can fight? No, I'm just saying, I'm just saying that, th that a religion tends to motivate people to fight. Now we've got environmentalis environmentalism, and um, in a way it kind of rallies people again to do political things. Well, okay? it certainly can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, th I think it does more than people realize. Then I went to the Crosswalk Church a couple of years ago, and they spent the whole time talking about environmentalism. And um, to me, I thought it was very secular, you know, as far as um, worrying about the environmentalist environmentalism. And then um, uh, then their their solutions to it were was all the stuff I heard on television, all of you know, cut back on this, don't use too much of that or the other thing, and I thought, you know, maybe somebody. That's when I thought that maybe somebody ought to tell God that when He comes, they come more green, because Paul says when He comes, the elements are going to melt. And then I think about these. Um, Asteroids that just went by the Earth. I mean, we had one that just that actually crashed, got into the atmosphere and blew up. Um, it's it's possible that um, lots of dangerous things can happen to the Earth. Uh, maybe the Lord, through His providence, is putting us right between disasters. I don't know, but um, it seems like there's mechanism going here that. Um, kind of contradicts our worry about making keeping the earth pristine. Well, we certainly don't have a pristine earth. There's no question about that. Because of us? Um, well, because of us and also because of the damage that was done by the flood. But yeah, we don't have a we don't have a pristine earth. There's no question about that. Uh, it does. It does, though, kind of raise the question, shouldn't we do something about it if uh, it's reasonably possible? 
Uh, and if we don't, don't we eventually destroy the very basis for... Uh, you know, one of the texts that I didn't see pop into this is the text in Revelation that talks about destroying them that destroy the earth. And uh, I, I found that fascinating. Uh, apparently well, there is... What does is that mean, though? That's... I mean, there's a lot of things that destroyed the earth. Even Satan and his angels destroyed the earth. Well, among other things, war destroys the earth. War, yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, go ahead and uh, let's see, Nick, and then, and then Lane. It seems to me that we as human beings are, are remarkably mm, gifted in the sense that when we want something, we can always, always cook up a very good sounding rationale for why that's a good thing. Uh, and uh, so sometimes people who are, who believe that they're very religious, and uh, I have no reason to question it, come up with this idea that because God gave us dominion over things, that means it's for our pleasure uh, to do with as we feel and as we see fit, whether good, bad, or ugly. I suspect that that's a very shoddy conclusion. On the other hand, if I think about people who start from the other spectrum, i.e. survival of the fittest, I don't see how they could possibly come up with preservation of s some endangered species as a, as a desirable goal. I mean, isn't evolution supposed to eliminate the species, species wholesale in order to promote some to take their superior place for some reason? After all, all the dinosaurs died so that the mammals could take their place. There is all kinds of uh, explanations to such effects. T to me, that, that, that I don't, it sounds somehow the logic of that sounds somehow hollow. What, what bothers me is that people from both ends of this spectrum somehow end up with uh, reasoning that essentially undermines the very house we live in. And it, it seems just plain destructive. What, what's more is it seems like a form of scapegoat hunting. Um, if you're trying to do something for somebody, but you happen to have the opposite ideology to mine, then everything you do is wrong by definition. And vice versa. This kind of politicization of just about every line of thinking is not helpful. Um, it would seem to me, sometimes I have felt that I had more in common with a faithful evolutionist than a faithless Adventist. This may be a radical statement to make, but the one thing that seemed to me that I had in common is that both of us were faithful, though to different things. And I could kind of relate to the faithfulness, if not to the object. But I have difficulty with people who want to have it both ways, who want the goat as well as the money. That's a problem. I don't understand how one can do that. Or in the immortal words of uh, Theodore Kaczynski, each of you can have it too. Go ahead. I would like to 
address uh, two issues. The first one is the environment, how to have a reasonable balance between opposing interests. We don't want a pipeline going through the U.S. because it may pollute our environment. Our environment is sacred, but the environment of uh, Saudi Arabia in Iran and Venezuela is not sacred. So we will fight wars. We will kill s lots of civilians. We will kill our own soldiers to protect the oil that we get so that our environment is not polluted. Now, the other thing <laughs> I would like to mention is you made reference to autonomy, to stewardship, and abortion. Now, autonomy means, se means self-government. I checked my dictionary. That's what it says. It's self-government, not government by some other authority. In Apos the Apostle Paul, as you mentioned, said, our body doesn't even belong to us. It belongs to God. Yet, some of our leaders, and I will not name names, use the argument of autonomy in order to build our guidelines on abortion, defending the idea that women should have a choice. A choice to do what? To do good? or to do bad. Choice, a choice to kill their own unborn babies on the basis of autonomy. I think this is wrong. I, I could be wrong, <laughs> but please tell me why I'm wrong. Uh, Elaine, and then uh, we have a comment right next to you. Um, thank you, Nick. Um, what I was responding to was the text that God would destroy those who destroy the earth. And I think this must be really sad for God. But when he was falsely accused by his most supreme creation, the greatest being he ever made was Lucifer. And still probably the smartest being in existence. And this amazing angel turned against him. Well, what's God going to do? Wipe him out? That isn't going to work if love exists as a real thing. And so he has to let it self-destruct. And I think in my choosing to be a creationist, who believes in scripture in my choice ahead of science which generally I don't have to make that choice <laughs> science backs it <laughs> but I am choosing to be on the side of the one who is not going to self-destruct whatever the cost to me in the meantime because there's a war going on Yes, you said something early in your presentation that was helpful to me, and that is about how uh, an inappropriate presupposition can lead to a truncated sort of philosophy. And as a health ministries director in our conference, I, I am walking into a situation like that next week, and I, and I think of the wonderful tensions that the Bible gives us and, and the Lord tests our reasoning powers. He, he wants our faculties to be balanced because we were originally endowed with balanced minds and noble characters. And so this idea that you put forth is helpful to me. And I think of the tension in this topic with Isaiah chapter 24 where it says the earth mourns and fades away, the world is languishing, and uh, the earth is defiled under its habitants because they've transgressed the laws, moral and physical, natural, civil, 
everything, <laughs> broken the everlasting covenant and the curse has devoured the earth. Now I will be dealing with a pe group of people next week who land very hard on that and they are a rabid uh, environmentalists and I expect to get a good picking at over it. But I, I uh, while I respect, I think, some of their positions, I am also reminded and, and filled with hope with Genesis chapter 8, verse 22, where the, the Bible reassures us, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night, it shall not cease. And so, yes, there are some levels of problems with this planet and with what we eat, but God has built so much redundancy into the food supply. He's built so much wonder and, and so such adequacy even now, even in the face of these problems. And if we don't have a healthy appreciation of that, then we will be hopeless, miserable, sour people who have lost their mission to win souls for Christ. Right here, this side of the room has been relatively yeah. quiet. We have two, <laughs> we'll two people up. here, but uh, so okay. if, if you want to speak, raise your hand. Trust me, we'll get you the mic. <laughs> Right. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll make this personal. In the 1960s, I was very interested in the creation controversy and and um, started taking classes at Andrews. I was undergraduate and then graduate student. Um, we said almost nothing about environment in our creation discussion, at least at Andrews in the 60s kind of interesting how it's woven all through this uh, presentation today as part of the doctrine of creation. I, I, I never thought of that. I thought of flood and age of the earth and all these other issues. And then in 1980s when we returned to Andrews, my wife and I, and we had a little girl that came up through Ruth Murdoch Elementary and then Andrews Academy she was the one that had to educate us as parents about environmental concerns and recycling and, and all kinds of things. So that was very illuminating. But I think we need balance here. You know, are we going to just jump on a current bandwagon that's popular, it's a political movement and so on, the Green Revolution? I, this is my personal view on the Green Revolution that Yes, you can accomplish things by making laws, but you have to change hearts and change attitudes and education. I'm glad an educator just spoke. You have to start with educating, getting people to rethink their thinking. And laws are not enough, I don't think. You know, we could have all the best laws in the world about how we uh, protect the environment, um, but we still get lots of plastic bottles thrown along the highways. So <laughs> anyway, that's my personal take on this. Let's, let's deal with changing the heart, and that's what scripture is all about. And uh, I, I think that that's uh, a very important point that I is often missed. Uh, when God tells Jeremiah what I really want, it is not the law where everybody says to your neighbor, know the law. It is where it is written on your own heart. And I think that, the, that this kind of thing goes a long <laughs> way. I'm reminded of uh, uh, two people who ran for president, one of whom had a mansion that uh, took, if uh, the reports are correct, something like, 20 times the electricity of the standard uh, home, um, justifying it, of course, because he's an important person. The other one of whom had a house that, was, uh, that used recycled water and had uh, foundations that went down deep enough to bring uh, uh, heat in the winter and, uh, and the cool air in the summer to decrease the electric bill of the place. Uh, and yet, you wouldn't have guessed that from the, uh, from the press reports that, uh, of these people's positions. 
in, in politics. Uh, and I think that that's an important thing. It, it isn't enough to say you're on the side of the environment. It's a question, you know, are you doing the things that actually help? Do you recycle personally? And sometimes we get the idea that if we can just jump on some kind of global bandwagon, we can kind of live our lives the way we want to. Uh, maybe if we buy carbon credits, that will, that's sort of the modern day indulgences. Um, anyway, we have one here, we have one here, and then we have two over here. So, go, go ahead, straight back. Go ahead. I just uh, like to second to certain extent what Warren just said. Uh, <clears throat> there are two extremes here. As Dr. Schiller mentioned, there's this danger of making environmentalism an idol, a new religion, yes. And it tends to take over the place of religion in people's thinking. <clears throat> and this is very destructive. Our goal is to help as many people as we can, help God save as many people as we can. And uh, if we let environmentalism take the place of that, uh, we're spending our lives on that which is not most important. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Lynn White, you know, in his famous paper and uh, science accused Christians of being you know, against the environment, destroying, being utterly and not caring about the environment and uh, this. Uh, and to a certain extent, that there's been some truth to that. And that we need to take care of the environment. But we must not make environmentalism an idol. I would suggest that that's the reason why we didn't hear as much about it in earlier Adventism is because it was difficult to find that balance. And uh, people on one side of the issue would hear you in one way, and people on the other side of the issue would hear you the other way. And, and so we just didn't make as much of a deal of it. Um, but when I was a kid, it was, it was already thought, you know, you really ought to, they didn't call it the environment, they, but the, you shouldn't trash the, the roadside, for example. And uh, in fact, we used to, you know, if we were in some place, we'd, left it, we'd leave it cleaner than when we left, when we came. Well, in, in fact, it's a, a wonderful occasion for me because I'm from Brazil. And I was really interested to see uh, the reaction of ad an Adventist audience uh, uh, regarding environment issue. Because uh, I have been following all the election issues that you have here, had here in the United States, and all the discussions. And uh, what, what I have seen from outside, from other country, that uh, most of uh, traditional uh, religion persons from Baptists, from uh, Presbyterians, from Methodists. Uh, they are creationists. They are also uh, development uh, people. They are pro-pipeline, they are pro-some things. And um, I really found it uh, different because, well, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's something different for me because I'm, as a creationist, I'm, I'm I, I lean towards s protecting the environment, but I, I, I saw something different. And, uh, and what uh, conclusion did I come? First of all, that uh, as Seventh-day Adventists, we have a unique message regarding environment. Because we, we are creationists by one side. We have the Sabbath as uh, our one, of the, one of the foundations of our beliefs that uh, reminds us every time, every week of the creation. We, are, we have the expectancy of the second return of Christ here. Then we, saw all, we see all these shifts in the environment and uh, in weather, and w we see this uh, some, some, uh, as something predictable. 
And uh, I, I, first of all, I really see this as something special that uh, we have as Seventh-day Adventists. Second of all, uh, by all the, the discussion that was presented, I, I really see that our uh, and is f uh, with God, not with the environment. There's a huge difference there. Because some people, are uh, they have their uh, um, commitment to the environment, and uh, the environment only. And they go far beyond with some ideas, with some, uh, some extreme ideas regarding protecting the environment. But when we see uh, our allegiance with God, uh, we see our, uh, our still worship towards the environment as a consequence, not, not as a cause, not as a foundation, but as a consequence to be a good Christian, to follow Jesus, and to expect the Christ's return. Go ahead. Um, <coughs> I'm from Oregon now, but I was living here, and I know <coughs> several of you here. Uh, but, uh, you know, I just think about the story in the Gospels where Jesus fed thousands of people and then when they were collecting up the food, he said, don't waste any, come bring the food and let's not waste any. And I just, you know, in my own life, I remember my grandparents uh, living on a farm and, uh, you know, <laughs> hearing stories about they would fill the bathtub with yay amount of water and everyone would use the the same water to take a bath every day. They would, uh, they would be very careful with the, the, um, the glass jars that they would collect from the purchases they made. And, you know, my grandfather just died and we were down in his basement and he had all sorts of jars and, and things that they had been very careful to not throw away and, and, to, and they were very careful with consumption. And I just think about my own upbringing. I mean, we, we filled tons and tons of trash bins every day. I mean, we would just go buy the stuff at, the, at Costco or wherever, throw out the plastics. You know, we don't care. Where, we don't think about where does that go? Where does all that end up? And, uh, and I was just thinking to myself, you know what? I think I personally need to, to be a little less consumptive. I think I'm still too m more consumptive than I should be, and I'm probably hurting the environment in some way that, that, uh, that we, you know, we, we need to think about. You know, as just spiritually, I think we, we are struggling with this whole thing of lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh. And you, uh, you, you want that item. You, know, you go to Starbucks and you just want it. You want that coffee or you want that whatever it is, that, that container of something. And now you have this container and you don't want to keep it in your house. You know, because pretty soon you're going to have a thousands of them, and so you just throw it out. And I, I was just thinking that we may maybe need to, to get back a little bit toward how our grandparents used to live. I'm sure many of you were, had those kinds of experiences. And, and, you know, obviously we're trying to find a balance, and we don't want to be, you know, so, you know, lack of consumption that we, you know, that we're hurting our health in some way. But... I think that we are still, many of us are still f far too consumptive in our lifestyles, and I was just thinking that I need to perhaps improve that as well. Yeah, we um, can look at how to um, uh, consider the, you know, the, the fact that in a developed nation, though, uh, when a disaster, natural disaster occurs, <clears throat> the effects are usually less damaging or less extensive in terms of human life as compared to third world countries. So that this the development the, uh, of a higher standard of living actually creates a situation where uh, one is more safe against uh, natural disasters. And, uh, you know, you can think of uh, the Hurricane Sandy when it tore into the north uh, northeast. If that had happened in a third world country, you would have had many, many times more of life loss than, 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 uh, than what happened there. And it was because it was highly developed. 
And uh, so there is, in a way, a natural uh, uh, consideration that one takes towards, you know, the, the importance of development in a, in a country. Uh, so it, it's how we handle it that uh, becomes uh, the key issue. I would have to agree. I think one of the things that's frustrating for me with the green movement, although I have no desire to destroy the earth, is a shallow amount of thinking that goes into a lot of the positions that are held, such as I happen to have a, a hybrid. But the batteries in that hybrid and the rare earth elements in the, are not mining that in China is not exactly helping the environment right now. So there's most of these issues, if you don't look at them a little more carefully and you do the, what most political politicization of them does is very shallow intellectual thinking you often don't arrive at good conclusions and and because there's a lot of variation in how you can look at these things unfortunately it's human nature to whatever doesn't affect my lifestyle is righteous and whatever affects your lifestyle that may be hurting the environment is bad and therefore I can gloss over mine and rationalize mine but there are a lot of pros and cons. The pipeline, um, forgive me, I thought it was a natural gas pipeline. If it's a natural gas pipeline, then the, then the, the um, environmental effects on natural gas would be less than oil, and, and so it goes. You know, if we went back to a more simple lifestyle and burned wood, we would then hurt the environment and so forth. So I, I think that, that it's, we should think a little deeper scientifically, a little more carefully, before we jump on one position or other and allow others to look at it differently. The best rational response to the environment issues of global warming I saw was recently a movie called Cool It by an environmentalist that deals with how the money's being spent to fight global warming and what could be done to help starvation and the health of the people in third world company countries with the same money which would then affect our environment and the amount of things that are burned and the jobs that they have and the way that our, our temperatures are affected even greater than all the money we're spending doing the things with carbon changes and it was a, a good it's called cool it it was a good rational one of the few rational approaches I've seen to dealing with global warming issues now um, I'm going to point out I know some of you have other places that you have to be it is now 11:30. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to allow a couple of other comments here, but uh, I, if you need to to leave, you may do so without embarrassment. And those of you who wish to continue commenting can can do so. Uh, let's see, we have one here. We have one uh, uh, Ariel Roth. Okay, I'll, I'll talk while some are leaving. I wanted to address something to our Brazilian friends, maybe to enlighten you a little bit on what's happening in the evangelical world. I've attended uh, conferences by evangelicals. Uh, the more fundamentalist evangelicals uh, definitely are not pro-environment, as we would call it. You picked up correctly in the political debate. There are other evangelicals, namely those who accept a lot of evolution and who um, believe that the earth is millions and millions of years old. They're the alarmist ones and they're um, really out strong to try and protect the environment. So you have those two groups among evangelicals. Now the question is why? Why would those who uphold a very strict doctrine of creation, why would they not want to protect the environment? I'll give you one possibility. I don't have all the answers, but I heard uh, a few years ago that James Dobson, who's uh, head of Focus on the Family, headquarters in Colorado at Bold, uh, Colorado Springs, he made the statement that evangelicals don't want to get too involved in the environment because it leads to the passing of restrictive laws. And he phrased that in terms of the abortion debate. So follow my reasoning here. If, if we're protecting the environment, we're um, 
helping feed the millions around the world, the population is increasing, how is humanity going to handle that? By restrictive laws and providing for free abortions around the world in all countries and all cultures. And so when you're pro-environmental, in Dobson's view, you're pro-abortion. I don't know if Nick is still here. He may want to say something on that, too. <laughs> uh, go, uh, go ahead, and then uh, Ariel, and then uh, Nick. There was an interesting uh, group that uh, did a study of going back uh, to our roots, and they discovered that if uh, everybody in New York City went back to a horse and buggy in one year's time, the uh, output of the horses would cover three stories on every road in New York City. So then we'd have to get rid of it. Uh, go ahead and then uh, Nick. Uh, it seems to me we could profit a little bit um, by some more careful studies uh, on this issue of uh, carbon footprint and carbon output and global warming. Uh, you look in the fossil record, folks, and it tells us very clearly the past was warmer. Many studies point this out. You find salamanders above the Arctic Circle in Spitsbergen in the fossil record and so on. The earth was much warmer in the past, long before we had the internal combustion engine or all this talk about uh, uh, we're heating up the environment. We are, we're not sure about this issue. And in fact, uh, I, I heard a news item a couple weeks ago at the United Nations is saying, hey, maybe not all uh, increase in temperature is due to uh, human activity and so on. There are many factors involved in this. It's a very complex thing. Uh, and it's, it could be that uh, society is uh, uh, creating a lot of problems for itself without doing the homework first. Sometime we'll have to take up that subject explicitly. Uh, go ahead, Nick. OK, again, uh, two comments. First, regarding our responsibility to uh, the environment. Uh, I remember when I was young, water was very scarce for us. We were poor. I had to walk several blocks to get the bucket of water and several blocks to get to the to a faucet where you turn the faucet and get free water. And people used to sell water and sometimes we had to buy water. So imagine when the, the baiting time came, you had to be very careful. Now, I was reading that because of this, it used to be the following practice. The first one to bathe was the father, the man, then his wife, then the children, and then the babies, in that order. Now, my comment about abortion. This argument was used several decades ago very, very effectively in order to support abortion. And even our president of the North American Division, Neil Wilson, used that argument when he said the Adventist Church is leaning towards abortion because there are too many people in the world and too much hunger. In other words, we should start killing the unborn because otherwise we are endangering the world. And at that time, I do remember that uh, there was an argument saying that the population explosion was to be feared more than the atomic war. Now, what you're saying is that people like James Dobson were not totally off the wall when they had those fears. 
Well, we have to <laughs> we have to make a judgment, and the scary tactics are used by the enemy to force us, you know, to deceive us. That's what Obama is is doing right now with the fiscal problem. He's trying to scare that if we don't if we don't avoid the sequestration, that all ter all kind of terrible things will take place. And the uh, the truth is that what Republicans want is just to put the, a stop to the increase of spending, not to decrease the spending. It's all deception, based on deception. Well, I think I think that's a a major problem in this whole thing is that people are saying what they don't actually uh, want to do. Um, the Malthusian mathematical model that was used to create the scare during that time turns out doesn't exactly apply as directly as we thought. We've applied that to AIDS, we've applied it to other things, and sorry, it's not that straightforward. There are an awful lot of factors that control many different populations. I would like to say it some other way. But also, there's a real simple thing, and that is when women are educated, the population, the uh, number of live births that live past age five drops to about two per family when a woman can make even a minimal amount of money. Interesting. Well, I think with that, uh, I'm going to invite you all to come back next week. Um, and uh, we're going to be talking about uh, something that has, I, I think, pretty obvious connections, uh, uh, creation and the Sabbath. And then uh, the week after that, Andy McIntosh will be here. Uh, uh, so uh, you're welcome to... Uh, you're welcome to come back and uh, hopefully enjoy some more discussion. Uh